So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Len Lonzi. I'm the managing director of the Precelerator program here in Santa Monica. We're a program of a law firm, Stubbs Alderton Market Lease, located in Sherman Oaks, California. It is a full service uh, law firm, and uh, we are very thrilled today to have one of our former Precelerator program participants, Cynthia Harrington, uh, to do this masterclass on becoming fundable and how to build your pitch deck. Uh, it's a great program. Uh, it's going to be interactive. So the way we want to do this, if you want to interrupt and ask a question, that is fine. But the way we want you to do that, please go to the reactions button at the bottom of Zoom and hit the raise hand button. And then your hand will go up just like it did for me. And I will see that and then I will call on you. That way we don't have people speaking over one another and it makes it a lot easier uh, to manage. Uh, any other questions or comments? Again, in chat, you will find the workbook that was sent to everybody prior to the call. Uh, we ask you to download that and, and reference that as we go through the program. So without further ado, I'm going to put the spotlight on our speaker, uh, Cynthia Harrington. And uh, Cynthia, I'm not going to do a long introduction here. I'm going to let you take care of that yourself. Uh, you're on. Fantastic. Thanks, Lynn, and welcome, everybody. Lynn Lancy has this uh, pre-selator program that he wants us to run here. You know Lynn? Lynn and Lancy? I think I heard the oh, name. Hang on. Okay. Uh, we got him. Sorry about that. Okay. So um, as, as Lynn mentioned, uh, this is really very much a working session. It is the synthesis of all of the advice that I got while I was pitching and funding my company, Team U, that went through, as Len said, one of the early precelerator. We began in March of 2013. I sold the company in 2017. The, the funding process uh, is so multifaceted. You'll get advice from every source that will be a little bit different than the source before. So what I've done is pulled together and really synthesized the elements that, you, that you're going to hear from everybody into a 10-slide discussion that looks at what you need, what you need to think about before that, that, that element of your company, what you want to present on the slide and what the investor is thinking about, what the investor is, is, is calculating as they're looking at that, at that slide. So everything will be in those three steps. Your job as CEO, I don't know how many CEOs we have, but the, the CEO's job is to find funding, uh, make sure that the rest of the team has the money they need in order to grow the company. As the, as the funder, as the company manager and, and during that funding process, you want to be excellent at every element of your company or have someone in your universe that is. So what we're going to be talking about today is that point of excellence for these 10 slides. The, at, the, at the end of the, of the uh, session today, you're going to have a very basic deck. It's not going to be pretty. This isn't about putting a pretty face on your pitch. This is about really digging into from the bottom up, talking about and revealing the excellence in, in 10 elements of your business. Um, you'll know how to write your pitch deck. You'll know, you'll get, I hope, some better, a, a new view of how to look at your story. Um, but this is, I kind of bill this as, as the MBA of, for pitch decks. So why am I here? Um, I spent 30 years managing money in the public markets. I hold the CFA um, designation, which means I'm an expert in public market valuations. Um, I've got a huge network of connections uh, in the CFA charter holder community alone. It's 170,000 investors. I speak at, um, at industry conferences. Um, I, was, uh, I founded a large cap um, SEC registered investment advisor before I got into, into startups. And I'm a coach. Um, as 
as a founder, I raised a million dollars in seed money. We had an education company. We grew it to about 30,000 students and then found a buyer. So I particularly understand the uniqueness of, of these niche markets as well as, as go to markets in different um, sort of non-traditional consumer um, uh, companies. The material behind what you're gonna be looking at today is an, a synthesis of all of the, as a, as a former investor, I really looked at how the, how the people that would evaluate me wanted to hear my story. So it's a synthesis of Dave McClure, Peter Thiel, David Rose, Y Combinator, Sequoia, a little bit from each one of those, but basically the commonalities that go throughout. Um, then I also worked for a crowdfunding company and I, was, I helped them with valuations where I did 20, 30, 40 companies in a year. Uh, so this is the background of what you're gonna be looking at or about, you'll be hearing about today. For a first step, um, what the investor really wants to hear in your pitch deck is the quality of your thinking about your business. And the themes that they're looking for is that you might understand the, the investor is looking for two things. They want to evaluate how much they're going to get, what's the potential upside, but they also want to, they're also listening to what you're telling them is what, what limits my risk. And as you, when you can speak to all of the things about your company that would be uh, stating why it's not going to fail, the investor is going to, you're going to catch the investor's attention. So you need to know then why startups fail. Almost, the, the biggest reason is there really wasn't any need for the product. Then you run out of cash, you didn't have the right team, you might have a perfect product, perfect timing, funding, if you don't have the right team to execute, um, you might actually have some early success, but you get outcompeted. Somebody moves faster with a better idea. And then sometimes it's just because you haven't priced your, your product correctly. And the five elements that do lead to success all of which you will want to speak to in your pitch um, uh, proposal. You've got a great idea. You've got a great team. Your business model um, in terms of both unit economics and, um, and pricing works. You've got funding and you're entering the market at the right time. That sense of urgency in, in presenting your idea and your pitch to the investor is, is an even bigger deal than it was um, in when I was, was making the rounds with investors. They want to know not just that you've got a great product, but that the investors pain or that the user's pain point today will have them buy. What we're going to do today is I've organized this workshop in basically the 10 steps. None of this is rocket science. You've probably seen it all before. But when you organize your thinking around these 10 steps, you may not organize your final pitch deck around these 10 steps, but the organizing the thinking around problem solution, a product demo and how it fits with the solution, the size of the market opportunity, your business model, which is pr um, pricing and unit economics, your traction, what proof points, is this gonna work at all? The team, competition and financial projections. When you've thought through those, that's what the, um, the investor is going to be listening for. What's the quality of your thinking behind all of this? Where is your business in, 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 in growth stages in each one of these elements? And only once you've really thought through all of those do you come and say, have, have the information that you need to, to do the ask, which is we need this much money, we're going to do this much with it, and, and uh, Mr. or Ms. Investor this is the results we're going to create with, with that investment. So our formats, we're going to go through these 10 elements one by one. The format is I'm going to, I'm going to describe um, what the thinking is that you need behind uh, each one of the steps, what you're going to want to actually display on the slide, and then what the investor is, is, is gleaning or thinking about, uh, calculating actually, as they're looking at each one of the slides. And then finally, at the end, we'll just pull it all together and show how to thread a narrative. As Len mentioned, um, I, and I typically have at least 90 minutes to do this workshop. We were able to cut out some things because it, because it was repetitive for what, you're, what you gain in other parts of the precelerator. 
we still it's still a little squished. So I'm going to go through it very quickly. If you have a question, if you have a comment, just interrupt and and we'll I'll um, answer it at the moment because it's better to have it. Uh, I'll, I'll get through it, but I want to make sure that things are clear. So this this is an example, uh, a very interesting example of a final slide uh, of this company Eduplation uh, that makes basic, basically math um, um, uh, program math um, apps for students that that are very engaging. And before their ask slide, they did a summary slide. Um, they said they went through the ten slides and they said, "Here's what we've told you. We've told you we've got a great timing and product. We, we're funded or we're um, backed by industry experts. We're go getters. We're going to make it all happen. We want to make a difference." And this this it was very timely. So a little summary right before they went to the ask. So the fundamentals of every pitch, a well-defined problem statement, the, a, a global solution to that problem. So wouldn't it be great if we could solve this with all of these wonderful things? And then guess what? We have it, our product and how it solves the problem. The size of the market opportunity. And this is important because Many investors have, have minimum thresholds. When I was pitching, it was many investors would not look at anything that didn't have at least a billion dollar market opportunity. Business model, traction, team, competition, and your financial projections. And once you've thought through each of those, then you can do the ask. So now we're going to break out the workbooks and in You'll see, you'll notice right in the beginning slides, I've, I've, I, have a, I have a copy of this page. And um, one of the things I said is by the time you actually want to go pitch to an investor, you want to have all of these be, be an expert in each one of them. And maybe you are today and you're just here to um, get a few more tips. But if you haven't met, done many investor pitches yet, take, take a moment and evaluate where are you in each one of these. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see I've got um, some temperatures that you can evaluate yourself and go through each one. How complete are, is your story? How comfortable are you with, with, with that the, the, you, you, you've thought through each one of these elements? And I'm gonna just, just take a minute and grade yourself um, on each one of these uh, and as to where you are today in terms of putting together your, your deck. Cynthia, we have a, uh, our first question from Mark Siegfried. Mark? Yes. Uh, thanks, Len. <clears throat> hey, Cynthia, um, a question for you. I know the purpose of this workshop is not to come out with something that's you know all printed up. But I do have a question with regards to the slide you showed on education. Um, and that is, how important is it that when you're constructing your slides, you're using kind of cool graphics and you're trying to give an investor a, a, a feel of what the culture of the company is? You know, I'm sorry, tell me, that, who, who asked the question? Uh, Mark Siegfried did. Uh, Mark, Mark that, that is just an excellent question. And I'm so glad you asked because it really is a, a component of, of, of how I've approached this, um, this workshop. This clearly is a final product. And, and, and not only is it a final product, but you might, if you've been pitching, you also know it's probably not a product that somebody is pitching, is using to pitch from the front of the room. You know, it's a, it's a slide that they would send in a deck that they'd that they'd actually send to somebody because you can't if when you're pitching in front of a room, you don't want to have all those little white you know the little white text on there. Right. Um, I learned when doing the decks for the crowdfunding company, we were actually a marketing company. Companies would the, the 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 companies looking for funding would um, get registered on one of the crowdfunding sites. Then they'd come to us to help them put together a marketing approach to, to so they could 
bring in bring attention to the fact that they had their stock listed on the on the on the crowdfunding platform. I learned there that if you do your deck without graphics first, the quality of your thinking, if you think, think if you approach this as a business person first and a, oops, sorry, and a graphic artist last, the quality of your thinking and your copywriting can be, it, it ends up to be much stronger. So think about what you, you want to say about that element of your business. Think about how you want to say it. What words are you bring the right kind of attention and at the very last hand it over to somebody to put it to make it graphically interesting i would never go with a slide like this in front of an investor this is not the finished product it's a finished product for those first two stages that i was talking about before you, you, you do want a pretty face on it before you go and talk to, before you want to actually do the pitch, but do the work first. Don't let the pretty face get in, get in the way of, of doing the work. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. That was great. Thank you. Okay. Okay, great. Oops. That's okay. <laughs> right. Um. So uh, that, gave, that gave everybody a, a chance to grade. Uh, obviously, that's just for your own purpose. And now let's jump in. So problem statement, this is the most important slide that you have. You, it is also the slide, the, it is also the, the text that you probably will write last um, because you have to understand what your business is before you can write the problem statement. And it's a short, succinct statement that sets the stage. The investor is thinking, it tells your investor how big the market is by who has the problem. And the way you express this statement defines the amount of pain that the user is in. So a good problem statement, it's like the first, first line in a novel. You want it to, that once they read it, they're absolutely hooked. Some of the things that make a good problem statement is they, may, they, they also recognize the problem. They've been looking as investors for somebody that's going to solve this problem. They may even have the problem. And they know who you are by how you describe it. And what I mean by that is if you come in describing the problem, just like the 10 companies before you, and you haven't either given it a new twist or looked at it from a little bit of a different angle, um, you're not going to actually hook them in the same way that you might by teaching them something or, or describing something in a way that they haven't quite thought about before. So well-crafted statement, uh, problem statement is specific, it's unique, and it's narrow. It also describes who has the pain and how intense their pain is. Let's take a look at an, at an example from the Uber original deck. And um, Uber actually had two problem statement slides. What, what do we learn here? Who has the problem? Well, cab, cab drivers and people who have to hail cabs. And there's kind of a systemic economic problem. Seems like everybody kind of had a problem in it because the medallion system was taking too much money out. Uh, it, was, it was putting... Um, uh, money not in the taxi driver's pocket, but in owner's pocket. Um, and, and, th and then they actually put their little solution statement on there. It's like, gosh, wouldn't it be great if somebody could just figure out uh, an app that you could hail cabs digitally so you didn't have to stand out on the street corner? This is a problem statement from a, from a niche company. And th this company, Ad Pushup, actually, actually raised a Series A with just two investors with this deck. And, and Mark, kind of to your point, it doesn't have to be massively pretty. If you really understand who the, your audience is with investors, you can make it, this is an actual problem statement <laughs> from their deck. And I read through this now, I'm not from Ad Tech. Um, I know a little, I know enough to get myself into trouble. 
But I read this and it might as well be gobbledygook. Display advertising CTRs have been falling constantly. And one of the primary reasons behind it is banner, banner blindness. Current players such as ad networks, exchange, so on, lots of lingo, not very pretty, problem, not very pretty slide. Um, but clear problem statement to people who knew what they were talking about. This, 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 this company probably did no public, no public pitches with a deck like this and way too much writing on, on the slide. Contrast that with, with education, what we saw before, great graphics and so on. Single problem statement. Too many children dislike ma mathematics and don't see the point of studying it. Everybody in the world understands that. Children have a pain point. It's intense. And at least with this statement, it's everybody who's K-12. They're all needing to study mathematics. So when the investor looks at your problem statement, they're doing a quick calculation of the size of the market because you've told them who the buyer is and they have some sense of where the money is coming from. They know whether or not they've learned something new. Have you said just exactly the same thing that all the other companies have said? Or have you, have you, have you really narrowed it or twisted it or given them a different view of, of the problem? And then they've also, they're also hooked by how familiar they are with the problem and what other solutions are out there. Um, there's a, a, a great investor, Jason Calacanis, who talks, who was one of the early investors in Uber. And he talks about the reason that Uber was so successful with, with investors was because they had a product venture capital fit. Everybody in the audience could see themselves not having to pay $100 or $200 for the black car that would come and pick them up, but that there would be these, the, the, this digital hail um, uh, solution. They all wanted it. So now let's stop for another minute. Write down your problem statement. Um, with this, with this new perspective, uh, we'll just do we'll just do one minute uh, in your workbook. Good. And now you go to a solution. Gosh, with all this, this, this user has this terrible problem. Here is how that problem could be solved. And um, it, this is the universal solution. So not your product yet. And all of the aspects of the problem you want to weave through into the solution statement. How does it solve it? How clearly does it match the problem? And how does the solution solve it for that audience. So, so tie it to the, the user that has the pain. Uh, this is Airbnb's, one of their very early decks. Um, this is their solutions uh, uh, slide, excuse me, which is, uh, gosh, it's terrible to have to go and stay in hotels all the time. Wouldn't it be great if there were a web platform where users could rent out their space to host travelers? Everybody could save money. Hosts could make money. And there'd be a shared, there'd be somebody to share the culture with if you stayed in their, in their house. Now, wouldn't it be great if somebody could figure out what that, what that solution could be? And here's that ad push up, their problem statement. Well, here's their solution statement. Um, if, they, if you only had um, something that publishers could optimize their ad revenues by testing different placements. And then if they had constant optimization, they could easily fight the big evil called banner blindness. So with this solution, you want all aspects of the problem statement that you've, that you've, that you've stated addressed in this solution statement. Um, and what the investor learns by how you express this is why doesn't the solution, they, they begin to, they begin to 
understand why the solution doesn't yet exist. They even are kind of making up a little bit of how the problem has come to be by, by what you're telling them. And they're beginning to see how this description of the solution can alleviate these pain points. The reason it's important to understand what the investors getting from this is because we, the human um, uh, um, verbal, um, uh, the human talks at 124 words a minute and our brains here at 800 words a minute. So through, you want to capture that whole space of the 800 words by how clever and how complete your solutions are. That's why it's important to do the text before you do the pictures. The pictures will take up some of that 800 word space, but not all. So you want to have answers to all of the questions that are coming up in that, in that verbal thinking gap. Then step number three is, wow, guess what? In that solution, you're so lucky. We have a product that actually meets all of those, all of those pieces, all of those steps, all of those pain points. As you talk about your product, let the investor be the user. You want to show the product and you want to demonstrate the features and you want to show where the features solve the market problem. And then by talking about it, you also want to illustrate how your product this investor has probably seen competitors, other companies that are pitching this same solution, it just tends to go like that. So as you talk about it, you wanna at least foreshadow some of the things that they may be hearing about competitors. So this is the product page for ad push-up. Now, I don't think this <laughs> illustrates very much, um, we, we get an idea, okay, I'm going to look at it on my computer and it's going to be a kind of a graph of what's happening. But they describe with this product, you get, you get advanced A-B testing. Um, you can test between different ad placements, ad sizes, ad colors, all using a simple visual editor. You don't need to have any program knowledge. And after you find the best one, you can uh, uh, you can track it to make sure that you're not getting banner blindness. As opposed to swipes. Um, this is a picture of the product. I don't, uh, clearly this is a deck that they're using to verbally present the product because all this visual says, and you, the investor is not reading this little tagline here in the back of the room, Let's see, what do I know about this visually if I've kind of lost track and I'm not listening? It's going to be on my smartphone. It's swipe, so maybe I'm going to, you know, move my screen back and forth, plan my day with lights. It's something about calendars. Not a lot of useful information for a visual quick scan. So as you demo, demo your product, the investors learning that now they're beginning to pull things together with what you've been telling them. So this is your opportunity to show, show how you solve the big problem and you have the solution. So they're listening to your products and features. You want a visual of how the product works. And uh, this is the opportunity to bring the investor in to be a user of the product. So size of market. This is, um, there's many ways to describe size of market. The one that many people start out with, even if they, in terms of their analytics and their research, even if you don't end up expressing your market this way, this obviously comes from Sequoia, which is the total addressable market, serviceable addressable market, and then serviceable obtainable market. It's a pretty good, um, working model to help you, uh, uh, give you a framework to pull everything together. So as an example, total addressable market would be all the automobiles sold in the world. And a serviceable would be all the autos our size. So you're, 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 you're comparing, okay, the, everything that, that everybody buys in, in our big market, and then 
here's the companies, the serviceable addressables, here's, here's really the products that we compare ourselves against. And then serviceable obtainable is basically how much of that market share can we, uh, uh, how, how big is the market share that are sold in our channels that we think we can get in, in three years, obtainable, uh, sales obtainable by us. And it's typically visually, there's nothing wrong with doing this, some markets don't lend them, don't describe, don't, it, it doesn't capture what your real market is as creatively and as specifically as you might, but there's nothing wrong with doing this, especially in the very early stages. Um, and I'm, I bring this illustration in because this is an education in, um, uh, a company actually put this together these are all of the subsectors in education. You can see the big ones across the top, knowledge and content, education management, and so on. And then even under knowledge and content, you've got knowledge B2B, B2C. You've got operations research. You've got curriculum. You've got education resources, B2B, B2C. So as you're thinking about your market, the more descriptive you are, doesn't not, not necessarily narrow, but the more descriptive you are, the more the investor learns simply from this slide. And again, the more they learn, the less they're trying to make up between that in that verbal thinking gap. So the size of the market is they're really evaluating, is this a big enough market? Some, some, some investors at this point, if you're not over, you know, if you're not in their size. Um, they'll, they'll just, they'll basically stop listening at this point. But they're also calculating if they are large enough. Now they're beginning to say, okay, how, how much can I really make from this company? And they want to understand, they're, they're really evaluating the quality of your thinking by how you talk about the size of your market, how you define your market, and then the, what kind of research you bring then to um, about the categories. Business model. Business model is how you're going to find companies and how you're going to get paid. So in the, within the business model, they want to know who's going to pay you, how are they going to pay, and how much. And with how much it's price per unit, but then also how much you're going to get from that, how much you make from it, the gross margin. And they want to know a little bit about how you're going to go after this serviceable, obtainable market. So business model, basically distribution is B2B to B2C, or sometimes it's B2B to C. Um, this, this um, uh, you know, who you sell to, sometimes even will define investors, sometimes investors only do B2C. So it's it, this, you, you begin to really categorize yourself here. They want to know the method of payment. And then um, Len and I were talking about this the other day. Typically, it's Series A investors who want to know your long-term customer value and your cost of customer acquisition, because really in the early stages, at best, you're making that up. You, you might do some educated guesses, but if you do have long-term customer value and, and cost of customer acquisition, this is where you might uh, display it. So here's ad push. Uh, this is, this is Pendo, and it's one of their early decks. Um, very clear. Mark, I mean, to your point, not very dressed up, but really clear. Here's our, here's our business model. We're going to sell direct, mostly to the inside sales team. Our current target customer is B2B web-based businesses. The person persona that we're going to talk to is the product manager, and we're going to do um, a monthly active end users per product. This is a really clear go-to-market um, slide from a, a, a school, um, a, a, an ed tech company. They've got three schools signed and they've got pilots going at 30 schools. They're in negotiations with two of the archdiocese, which is not a school, but a huge, you know, huge organization. And they've, they've qualified leads. So this is basically their whole sales pipeline. Very clear. Here we go back to education. Their go-to-market strategy, I believe this is not from the deck that they would present from the front of the room. We really look at decks 
in, in three different categories. You've got your you've got your 90 second deck, but basically then you've got a three minute pitch, a five minute pitch, and a deck that you would send out. The decks from the front of the room, this is way too much going on. You 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 lose the investor in that verbal thinking gap when you've got too much going on because they're not listening to you, you don't, have, you don't have their full attention. They're trying to figure out what is going on here. So with the business model, it's basically, how am I gonna find customers and how am I gonna get paid? At this point, the investor's starting to calculate how soon you're gonna be profitable. Um, they're, they're saying, is this even enough for me to, to waste my, you know, am I, am I gonna get a return off this? Is the go-to-market uh, strategy sound and have you proven it yet? So you're going to start thinking about traction. They're going to think, be thinking about, are you going to get fat, big enough, fast enough? And they're beginning to calculate how much more outside funding you're going to need. They kind of don't wait till the financial projections, right? They're starting at this with the business model and go-to-market. They can now begin to, and, 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 and they, know the, they know the user, they know uh, the size of the market, they know... Um, uh, uh, the pain point, they're kind of starting to calculate the financial projections already. And then traction. What proof points have you created? And this is basically, what have you done? Uh, what have you accomplished to date? But it can be expressed in different ways. Do you have sales? Obviously, that's the easiest, most objective. Uh, or maybe you just have users, you're giving, you're doing the freemium model, you're doing a bunch of pilots, you've signed strategic uh, partnerships. And there are high value proof points that can kind of stand on their own, current revenue, pilots that you got great feedback on. And there's low value proof points, which is a small number of users, or you got no user feedback. If you have low value proof points, you have to kind of have a countervailing reason. For instance, biotech companies have no users um, and just um, uh, a test going on, but they still need funding. So, uh, so then you have this is, you know, we've got this groundbreaking technology and it's going to cure everything, you know, for everybody in the world. You have to countervail with some sort of a strong technology, huge market to attract. So, so the, the, the traction... Um, it doesn't have to stand on its own. So here's a couple. This is a new um, email uh, company, this front, and their traction proof points is they've got users and buyers. And what's interesting is for them, what was really valuable, 2,300 companies is a lot. You look at these companies, ooh, it's all the cool, smart companies. And what, for, for them, what was also important is we're, we're, we're across industries. We're and there. I know we got we've got a whole bunch of different use cases. So we've got something that a whole bunch of people want to use. And this this buffer has got a lot of stuff, a lot of proof points that they included. They got users. They got revenues and margins. They got this wonderful hockey stick um, uh, uh, user uh, graph, uh, and they've got their their margins. So what you want to do with traction is play to your strengths. What are, the, what are the most important things we've done? And, you know, and kind of lead with sales if you can. Now the investor is starting to land the whole thing. They understand what, what, what stage your company is at. You've got a whole bunch of users and a whole bunch of sales. We're probably talking series A. Um, if not, you're somewhere, somewhere earlier than that. They're also starting to think about how much you're going to, what's the valuation? How much am I going to? If I, if I invest X, how much of the company am I going to get? The, what, what this, the importance of the traction slide, though, is to say, is, the, is there product market fit? And product market fit is something that kind of grows with the stages of the company. Um, if you've got a lot of sales, you've proven, yes, that it's there. If you've got a lot of users, but nobody has sold, well, we still don't have a proof that they're going to, that they're going to, pay the price. So um, that, that's the calculation that the investor is doing when they're looking at this, at this, at your traction. 
And then they want to know with the team, why is this the team that can and will execute on all this lovely plan that you've just laid out for them? What you want to express, and, a, and all team slides look kind of the same. You've got a picture, you've got a title. The, the, the high value information that you put does not necessarily be, it does not necessarily mean name, role with the company or title, and all the wonderful companies they've worked at before. What you really want to, the information you want to include on this slide, team slide, is why are these the people? What information, what background about these people prove that they're going to be the ones to execute on the plan? And, and that includes, um, you know, advisors and, and your executives. So you, you kind of want to let them know what the person is doing at the current company and then do put some proof behind that's they're the person that is going to be able to execute on this plan so maybe what have they done on this project right the, the, the this team came on we built this we've got you know 500,000 users and we've already we've already proven this is a, we, we can do it or it might be past successes um and especially with the advisors you want to include what you can allude to the size of a network as well as skill base by what um, by, by putting on past um, um, mini resumes. Uh, so here we are back to swipes, and I don't mean to pick on swipes. And I'm sure that this was a presentation deck, so that there's a not not a lot on here, but this isn't very hot high value information. We know that Casper's in engineering. We know that there's five people. Uh, we know their first name. We know, uh, so basically all we know on this, after looking at this slide, is we've got five people that cover engineering, marketing, design, operations, and front end. That's all we know. As opposed to this one, which um, says the two founders, uh, they talk about, this is from Buffer, the two founders, what they've done in with Buffer. So Joel took idea to revenue in seven weeks and he's got a master's. And Leo is the great marketeer. He um, brought, uh, grew user base from 200 to 55,000. And oh, by the way, Guy Kawasaki and Hinton Shah are our advisors. And we, we've already brought in some very interesting investors. So clear, compelling, get it. Here's another one that looks like they haven't, um, uh, you know, it looks like a much younger, younger company because they talk about some of the things that they did in the past. So 15 years of experience, man, you can read this from the back of the, it's kind of nice to see people's faces, but look at the text. You can actually read it from the back of the room and some investors will be sitting in the back of the room and neuroscience degree, founded two previous startups, um, started her first profitable business at, at age 16, high value information about the team and why they might be the ones to execute. So the investor here is evaluating, do you have the right people? And can you attract talent? They're probably also looking at where's the gaps? Uh, uh, if I come into this company, I wanna bring something more than, than money. What, what, you know, who do I have in my network that I could introduce to this company? And they will be satisfied. They will, you will have answered their question, can this team execute? And then competition and analysis. And I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because we talked a little bit about competition in the early parts, but what the, um, it's a, this is a critical piece of the, of, the, uh, of the presentation for many reasons. And it's primarily what the investor is learning. And they're learning who your comp competitors are, but more so they're learning how you think about who your competitors are. So you want to spend the time really um, being creative about this. And again, specific and narrow. You will. I hope nobody does a presentation of the competition like this, 
but this is a template that can get that can help your thinking because basically the competition template should always be answering the same questions have no more than five for a presentation deck for a deck you're going to send you could do something that's much more in depth but a presentation no more than five points of competition and no more than four companies in addition to you. And typically three are, is, is good. But you're going to compete on things like user experience. You're gonna compete on how well the company solves, your comp competition solves the problem. You're gonna compete on, you've got more features than they do. How easy is, are your, is your product to use and how much did the com other customers paying attention to you? So this is the Airbnb, this is what I mean, the, the expression of this, of this research might come out in many different ways. So this is their early, one of their very first decks of their competitive advantages. They don't even talk about who their competitors are, but you kind of know first to market, nobody's done it before. Um, the, and there's a host incentive. Enlist once, now we kind of know that it's not on Craig, you know, you're not listing on Craigslist or, or some kind of ad pages. It's super easy to use. Um, everybody can see the profile of both sides of the, of the platform. And they we're, we're great at design and brand. So this is back to that education. They actually had three competitor slides. They had this little matrix that we see most often. Uh, I mean, th this, um, this, this um, column presentation comparison, then they had a, 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 a graph matrix uh, landing a few of their competitors on grading them between dull and fun and abstract and meaningful. Then they actually had a case study against their major competitor. So with, with this slide, and this discussion, the investors really saying, how much do they actually know about their sector? Because what you talk about with your competition says as much about you as it does about the competition. And here's where they're starting to um, evaluate their risk in the deal. So who else is doing it? If, if, there's, if there's nobody else doing it, is it really worth doing? They wanna hear how you're gonna beat them because what they're doing wrong and what they're doing that's working that you can copy or do cheaper or better. So here you're going to kind of, you want to sort of echo your solution points. You want to echo your business model and your product features in how you talk about the competition. And then your financial projections, obviously you want to have some, um, but by the time you get here, the whole of your story, the, the, your audience has kind of already done a, a back of envelope calculation. So you want to be sure as well that these financial projections really weave your entire narrative through. For a pitch deck, you really just want revenue and expenses, basically cost of customer acquisition, revenue expenses and growth. Um, and then in the expenses, it can be De definitely want um, uh, uh, gross margins, and then things like that, things that are important, maybe churn rate. Um, they want to know how much you're going to spend on staff and, and marketing, the, you know, the big categories. Uh, some, uh, 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 I've got an example here that I'm going to show you that some don't actually do sort of gap revenue expenses at all, but they'll talk about they'll express their financials in, uh, in, in their metrics and some KPIs. While you're presenting your, um, while you're presenting your, while you're pulling together your financial projections, you might just as well go ahead and make a cash flow statement and balance sheet because you're gonna need that once you get into due diligence. Typically you don't send those out with a, with a pitch deck. So this is what I was talking about with the, with, with, with the display of financials. Now this actually happens to be not projections, but, but current from that company called Slidebean. You can make, you can do um, uh, PowerPoints and much fancier than I have done today uh, on Slidebean. And they, they talk about a revenue and then monthly recurring to revenue. So a ratio of how much is recurring. Um, then they talk about, monthly returning revenue growth. Um, 
I talk about new customers, lost customers. So they, they present their churn. So it's, and then they've got their, their lifetime, lifetime value, cost of customer acquisition. So this is how you express this does not have to be straight gap, you know, income, expense, and so on. And Revolut actually has a very traditional way of expressing their financials, and they put the ask right on the bottom. Here's our projections, and we need a million and a half uh, euros to do it. On the financial projections, they also said, here's our use of funds. But basically, it's the, it's the summary. It's the big line, you know, top line of what we've just told you in our projections. Uh, as opposed to the, this, this cruise consulting uh, is a company that does, will put, put these together for you. Very traditional way of looking at things. You got revenue, cost of goods sold, gross profit, and so on. So in the financial projections, they're learning, the, the, the investors beginning to pull everything together. Is this, um, uh, the story that they've just told us in terms of business model and size of market, is it reflected here? They now can also see if the company is, at what point you're gonna become profitable. So are you sustainable or how much money you're gonna need and when? They, they also now really have calculated how much money they're gonna get. Because the next, for probably the first question they're gonna ask you if you haven't shared it with them is, how do I get my money back? What kind of exit are you planning? And then finally you get to the ask. How much money do you need? What are you going to do with it? And what's, what are going to be the results? With this too, the, you're, they're beginning to understand or, or try to understand how much you're worth, what kind of valuation. If you want a million and a half pounds, what does that represent in terms of percentage ownership? Um, and the more detailed you can get with the proceeds, and uh, put it on a timeline, uh, the, the more informed the investor is as well. So this one, there's a lot going on on here, but it actually, it actually hits every single one of, those, uh, of these points. So we're asking for this number of dollars, and here's a little summary of what we're gonna do with it. We're gonna um, not just, we're going to take these actions, build a team, um, have a biggest, you know, here's our, our beta and, and uh, product milestone of a beta in so many months. We're going to do product market fit. We, we intend to get this many customers. And um, here's the major goals and the major time frame, all summarized at the top. And then they uh, 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 um, spell it out in the graphic down below about what we're going to do, exactly what we're going to do when. This was um, the Air, Airbnb uh, for their angel round, uh, how they express their financials. We are their ask, I'm sorry. We're going to raise 500,000. We think that's going to do 80,000 trips, and we're going to do 2 million in revenue. So this ending statement really rounds it out. They, they begin to see, is your valuation reasonable based on everything you told me? <laughs> Um, what's the size of the round? Um, if it's a $50 million round, that really guides what, uh, what kind of investor that you're going to be pitching to. They're going to evaluate top line enough, uh, enough to satisfy themselves that you know what you're going to be spending the money on. Um, is it going to be spent wisely? Am I interested in this company? Gosh, I apologize for this. That my my numbering got a little off over here on the on the left. It's it it it's not um, it's not you. It's me. Um, and um, and then and they're 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 in in your ending statement. They're really evaluating. Are you being realistic? Um, can you know, based on everything they told me, does this ask make sense? And you really want to remind them, like that first slide that I told you with that summary of, with eduplation, you really want to remind them why this plan is sound. Take just a moment to say we're raising a million and a half pounds um, because we've got this idea, the user needs help today, and we're the team to execute. So some little statement that just 
pulls everything together. And then after, so as you can see, I've made these slides very much to reflect the kind of output that you would have after you've gone through the kind of thinking that we talked about today. But there's um, next steps, obviously, like Mark said, you've got you've got to put some finishing touches on it so that it it pops. You, you, this is, there's no user story here, for instance. You might want to create a user story that really brings the audience into using the product. Um, but you will have thought through all aspects of your company. Hopefully, you will have answered for yourself, do you need to add team members and where? Um, do you need to tap, tap a, you know, a, a, larger, uh, a larger audience? Um, and you will have completed your, your financial model based on everything that you had set out earlier. And then you want to you have three pitches. Uh, many people want a 90 second pitch. So obviously you want to do one of those, um, but then you want a three minute pitch, which you'll have, if you think about meeting investors as sort of dating, it's kind of long enough for a first coffee date, kind of level of, in, of disclosure and information. You want a five minute pitch, uh, you know, or obviously we're doing these on a, a coffee date is Zoom calls these days. Um, but your five minute pitch would reveal more and you'd spend a little more time with them. But then you also want to have a pitch for an hour long meeting um, or, uh, you know, and or to, to, um, to, to be able to send with far more complete um, uh, items than the, uh, than, the, than the pitches for the front of the room. Um, and this was just, I mean, a couple of examples. Don't misspell things. Make every slide high value. Neither of these are very descriptive. Uh, don't put too much on any one slide. This, 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 there's so much going on here. You don't even want to send a deck like this. People just won't read it. Uh, make sure that they can actually see it. Uh, I took this and I, I, this is just the data from, from this. It's not as pretty, but you can read it. Uh, I encourage you, we're, we're, we're running over here and I, I see there's a few questions which we'll stop and take, but I encourage you now that we've gone through this to go back and evaluate each one of these um, items and see, see if you've learned or decided to think about uh, uh, one of the elements differently. And uh, then uh, this is the part that Len says that you're taking, you're doing, you do a very good job of learning, uh, finding investors, learning how to get investors through the precelerator. But once you've gone through and you're, you're, you're ready to have the conversation, then you make your list and start and start pitching. 